And here we are. Hi, everybody. Hi. Wonderful. I'm going to pop on my gallery view so I get to see all of your beautiful faces. Okay, so now tell me, can you hear me? Thumbs up if you can. Okay, looks like mostly thumbs up. Good, great, fantastic. So here we are again. Here I am presented with the question of what are we doing here? What, what, why are you coming to see? Why are we coming to make this connection? What can I do to show you how much I value your precious time? Because I know there are many, many things that you can do with this time, but you have chosen to be here with me and with all of us. And so therefore, I hope that I can make this time together meaningful. Now I asked in that you bring something to write on. So I'm going to ask again, I hope that you are prepared to do some writing because I'm going to um, guide you in a couple of exercises that require this. <clears throat> I'm going to be using some of the notes from last month because I realized there was so much that I went very quickly through and that we really need to digest. But one of the things that I did want to mention is what the note, the note about writing, that writing things down shifts the quality of the brain. The exact quote was, it shifts the activity from the right side of the frontal lobe, this is the calculator, the one who's worried all, all the time about everything, to the left frontal area, which is the creative, optimistic um, problem solver. And so it's a good idea to take this into account. I wanted to give us this option, this opportunity to use this understanding to write things down. So now, the first thing I'd like you to write down, first of all, I'm going to invoke our sources of refuge. So I invite you also with your hands at your heart looking directly above my head. So it's all happening up here. And I see above your head, above the screen, all of our sources of refuge have joined us in this endeavor. And they're pouring their light and their love into us. So we open to them acknowledging that we need sources of inspiration and we need a sense of support. And so we invite them to journey with us and to guide this interaction, my speaking, us sharing. Now I'm going to ask you to do the nine healing breaths with me, just so that we relax deeply into our essential nature and let go of any tension completely eliminate any tension in the body-mind so that we can open to the process of this exploration. So we start by simply closing our eyes and being aware of our breath. And as we breathe in, we feel tremendous vitality coming into our body. And as we breathe out, we let go any physical tension. So as we continue this inhaling radiance, exhaling, letting go of tension, wander through the body, look at all the different parts of your body and see where the sensations arise and dis disarm them, you know, breathe them out. So breathing in radiance, breathing in vitality, breathing out any kind of tension, simply breathing it out and letting go. So as we continue, with this sense of energizing and letting go. We think about our emotional life. And now we're going to give the deep mind. Now this means it's taking place other than on the physical body. It takes place in the mind. Our emotional attachments, our emotional hysterias, our emotional terms that are not functioning for us. 
So inhaling radiant light and now let, letting go of any emotional disturbance that we have. And don't try to figure out what your emotional disturbance is. It's much better not to bring it into the calculator, but simply into the feeling body that you're letting go of all emotional distress, all emotional tension. It's the tension that we want to relieve ourselves of, letting go of tension. Inhaling radiance, inhaling light, inhaling vitality, and exhaling any resistance, any tension that you find in the emotional life, in the emotional body. And now we want to concentrate on our mental formations, right? So any mental tension that we may have, all the things that we think about this and that and so forth, we're going to simply let go of all mental tension. Let go of all mental tension. And in this open space of relaxation, we're going to ask the deep mind a question. And this is what I want you to write down, the answer to this question. What is it in my life right now that is causing the biggest disturbance? Don't think about this. Just whatever arises, write it down and don't make a big thing about it. You, just a couple of sentences if necessary. One sentence should be just something to remind you when we engage in this process of working with the mind. So I'll give you a moment to do that. Okay, excellent. So now reach up and stretch. Uh, 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 stretch, 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 stretch. We want to be as awake as possible. Okay. This journey that we're discussing, this Tibetan Buddha Dharma, that is the basis of the presentation of our dances, we must understand the view, because it is distinct, it's unique. And it provides us or it offers us an exquisite opportunity to experience the life that we have, the awareness that we have, the consciousnesses that we have, to experience it in fullness, in vitality, in bliss and joy. So, but there are very specific ways in which this view is constructed. And the questions I asked my students who, my beloved friends who join me for our morning practice, at least for me, it's early morning uh, practice to send me some questions. And they really pointed towards this basic, this need for a basic, understanding what is the foundation of this construct that we call Tibetan Buddha Dharma, because it's definitely a methodical way of examining our life's experience and integrating our life's experience to actually provide us with a result. And we start right from the beginning with an understanding and this is something that it took me a while to realize when the Tibetan masters were giving their teachings when we first encountered them in the 60s and 70s, that there was, a, there was something missing from the beginning of it. You know, they started, of course, with refuge and bodhicitta, et cetera, et cetera, and the various deities and so forth, teaching the only way they knew how. They were teaching to other Tibetans. But in their culture, there was a basic understanding. There was a basic um, view that we didn't have in our culture. And this was with the ultimate purity of mind that each one of us, each one of us at heart 
and they speak about the heart, not at the brain, at heart. Each one of us is absolutely pure. In other words, there is no sense of judgment. There is no, this is good, this is bad. There is simply an innate purity like the sky, and this is an, an analogy that they often use, like the sky, the sky is pure. Clouds arise in it, smoke arises in it, all kinds of arisals occur within the sky. But the sky itself is never tainted by that. The sky itself is always pure. Now, this is just a metaphor, something that uh, is very important to understand as we communicate about these things, is that we're communicating with language that is limited. The thing about language is it's invocative. Invo invocative. So it can stimulate an idea, it can stimulate an experience, but it doesn't always stimulate the same experience for the different individuals who are trying to share and communicate. However, it's important to us because of our basic interconnectivity. Communication is really, really important. And the more skilled we become at it, the more we understand its limitations and its glory, the more we are going to be capable of working together, playing together, inspiring each other, uplifting each other, and together entering the enlightened state. So my attempt of communication is to take these experiences that I had with these great masters and tell you what it meant to me. This does not give it any kind of authority. This is simply my attempt at stimulating you. So if you hear something I say, and it doesn't make any sense to you at all, then it's your, uh, your obligation. If you're interested in making the connection, it's your obligation to let me know that. And you, we discover at least this has been my experience throughout my entire life, is that if you hang in there with communication and relax around it without any effort at trying to say my way is right, you find a meeting ground. You find that very often a lot of aggressive activities or disappointing activities occur because there's a basic misunderstanding. So now we go back to metaphor. I'm going to use a lot of metaphors because they enable us to spark something. Maybe, maybe, maybe on the other hand, they might, you might latch on to some aspect of this metaphor that makes no sense to you at all. And that's what you have to communicate. That's what you have to communicate. So I'm inviting you as we journey together. Whenever you hit a moment that you go, I don't know about this. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that's accurate. That's where you need to ask. You need to communicate your, sen your sensory feelings of disturbance because that will open a door for us to make a true communication, for me to really be able to share what it is that I'm thinking and feeling. And also, I'm like, I'm just another you know, person journeying on this path. I am no authority. Yes, I have a lot of experience. My experience may even go throughout lifetimes more than just this one, but I don't have it all. I certainly don't have it all. I do have a way because of these practices of relaxing deeply into my, my intuitive mind sense. My, and, and from there, Ideas arise that I don't even I don't even know where they came from, because that's the creative aspect of the mind. All of us have this. All of us have this. One of the things that was most um, exciting about this um, material that I was presenting last uh, session and then this one about neuroscience is again and again it's pointed to the fact that. This is what happens in the body-mind when you engage in this form of attention. There are various parts of the brain that light up. There are also parts of the brain that fall back when the, when the 
um, sensory experience is distorting. So looking at that, it illustrates these various practices that we're doing, why they are so effective and encourages us to continue them. So one of the questions that I'm going to head in the direction of to start with, because it's such an important one and it comes up all the time. The question was, why do bad things happen to good people? Why, why are we on a planet where things are so radically confusing? At the time right now, it looks like things are falling apart left, right, and center. We can't find the ground underneath our feet, et cetera, et cetera. So what about that? So this is the direction I'm going to try to go in, but I have to start with view. Meaning, according to these teachings, we are already pure. Our mind stream is already pure. However, arising within it, due to our relationship with the capacity of engaging in different mode dimensions of consciousness, different ways of perception. In other words, this perception we're doing right now, I'm sitting here, you're sitting over there. I'm separate from you, you're separate from me. We have some kind of connection. We have some energetic connection. We have some communicative connection. But essentially, we are all one. We are all one without distinction. And arising out of that, this multiplicity of duality arises. And our engagement there are like the clouds rising in the sky. They have a life. They have a reason for being. The reason for all of our experience has to do with this arisal. And this arisal has been going on. It's as infinite as the open space of the mind. However, it's essential that we recognize that we already are pure. We already have all of this within us. So with birth, when we arise in this dualistic universe, which is indicated to us the Nirmanakaya, yes, the, the body of gravity and density, when we arise here, there awakens in us the possibility for what I call the primal or original ignorance. In other words, we start to, the culture also encourages this, seeing ourselves as separate from everything, everything that exists. When that occurs then, there is an attempt to, there is a primal sense of fear, the need to protect, the need, because of course, as a baby, you're extremely vulnerable. So this is one of the first things that occurs within the body-mind, is this sense of vulnerability and what appeases this vulnerability. And then from there, we develop how to protect this sense of separation. So, but in our as we engage with consciousness, as we engage with our seeking to understand who and what we are, we need to be able to go back to that primordial pure mind that we arrive with, that, that part of our essence. This is what is continually placed before us in the Tibetan Buddhist teachings, that we're not here just to have a good and happy life. We're here to penetrate into the heart of the truth. And we're here to open ourselves to our essential nature, this pure mind. And we refer, they refer to it constantly, primordial pure mind. We experience it all the time, but we experience it in little flashes. Now, that wasn't the computer stopping, that was me. Did you notice when I stopped speaking for a moment, nothing was happening in your mind? No thought. There was nothing happening. This is important to recognize because constantly we are being presented with this open mind 
with this pure mind. We need to recognize it and appreciate it. Now, it doesn't take more than a few seconds for thought, sensory experiences, all the different consciousnesses to arise. But primordial, we want to touch in with that primordial essence of pure mind. So from this pure mind, then, we start to engage in the world. And if we don't have any previous training in our previous lives, then we encounter a very confusing array of things happening. There is the sense of pleasure, which we reach out for, and it gives a certain amount of satisfaction, but then it's, it's very temporary, this satisfaction. And then there's also pain. There's, you know, whatever is going on with the physical body, we experience it as pain or separation when, when the one that we, is protecting us walks out of the room or whatever it is, there is this sense of needing protection. So these things arise at a very early age and we develop our mode of trying to protect ourselves, trying to attract uh, all the different pleasures and holding on to them and then rejecting anything that threatens us. And as we continue, unless we can somehow touch in to that pure essential nature, we become confused because the basic confusion the ba is this basic ignorance, this sense that the world is a hostile place and I am separate from it and I need to protect myself. And the way I do that is by accumulating positive experiences and things and people and rejecting anything that seems to threaten this identity. When we, as we engage in this then, if we cause any sense of harm to ourselves or others, it creates another issue in the body mind, which is the sense of guilt, because we know this is non functional. It's non functional. And so we also know through experience that whatever we put out reflects back to us. Now, this is a basic observation of life that you drop a stone in the water there is a reaction there are ripples the ripples go out they touch everything then they come back in everything is changed by that mere stone being dropped into the water this is the um the way to really look at karmic situations. Now the question was, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, it's because there's no really good or bad in the sense that, yes, there are painful situations, but very often painful situations are encouraging our inner growth. And they are there because this whole experience of body, gravity, density is a training ground. We're here, we are capable of using these experiences to penetrate into the heart of wisdom, not only to touch base with that wisdom, but also to activate it in other dimensions of consciousness within gravity and density. We can do this. We, this, is what, this is what these teachings are telling us, is that if we use all of the opportunities that life presents us, and they're not all going to be pleasurable, not even a little bit. In fact, some of the greatest teaching moments are the challenges that arise through painful situations. And if we approach them using the power of our creative essence, that we are then empowered. And in that empowerment, then, we are capable of blessing others, uplifting others, inspiring others, which in effect is one of the greatest 
experiences, it brings the absolute most joy. Better than uh, eating our favorite foods or sleeping with our favorite lover. The, the experience of uplifting and inspiring and empowering others is so fulfilling. Now, according to our great scientists, these particular experiences bring about a hormonal uh, activity, such intense hormonal activity in our body mind that we, are, we can engage in pure bliss and this blissful situation of, of extending and blessing and empowering others will spread out and touch all the people around. So like the stone dropping into the water, it's not just one little act, it goes out. And the more it goes out, the stronger the vibrations that come back to us. So the, the idea then, the, the understanding, whatever difficulties arise in our life, they are either, for, they are always for our growth, but also they are occurring because somewhere in our infinite past, in our infinite lifetimes, we have engaged in activity that did not recognize the ultimate interconnectivity of our life. We didn't recognize it. We're still doing that. We're still doing that. Every time we get angry or upset with someone about whatever they did that causes us to feel diminished, we reject them. In that act of rejection, we ourselves are diminished because we are rejecting a part of ourselves. And this is not an easy thing to grasp. It's not an easy thing to work with because we've been trained through our culture that when people, when there are aggressive or diff difficult or painful situations, that we try to push them away. We try to imagine that they are not, they're not happening or um, we don't embrace them. We don't bring them in. This is where the practice of Tonglen is so powerful because it's saying, wait a second, every time you reject whatever is happening, now look, we've got a, an, an array right now. Not only do we have the pandemic dancing around the streets, but then we've got people who are in opposite camps the, the vaccinated, the non-vaccinated, okay, so we've got these uh, points of diversity that's where there's aggression. We have so many confusing things going on in the world. We have all of these refugees pouring in from these poor countries where people are being murdered. And so how do we do this? Well, that's the challenge. That's the, that's where you, we need to relax deeply into the open spaciousness that we are. And that's where we ask our question. That's where we ask our question. And we ask for inspiration to see what do I have to do with this? What do I do about all of this? How do I engage? And the Tonglen practice says, breathe it in. Because somewhere, you know, in our infinite lives, we are connected with everything that's going on. It's not something outside doing itself to us. It's we are part of the whole thing. So this uh, gathering in, this breathing in of all of the pain, all of the confusion, all of the suffering, we see it's part of our experience. It's part of our journey. But it's open in the infinite open spaciousness of our essential nature. It is simply a cloud arising. And whatever gifts it has to bring, whether it's destruction like a hurricane or whether it's a gentle nourishing rain, whatever gifts it has to bring, we are gonna be there for it. And we're going to approach it to see how does it stimulate our wisdom and compassion. And through that, we ask, we seek to find a strategy to deal, remaining open and relaxed for whatever comes. Now, 
I'm saying these things, but I know that this is not easy. It's not easy to experience. It's definitely not easy to execute. When His Holiness the Dalai Lama, we asked him, how, how can you call the Chinese your brothers and sisters? How can you do that? Well, they're murdering your people. And he said, practice. In other words, this, these are options for the cultivation of our mind and our capacity to move within all the dimensions of experience as a radiant light being. But it's not easy. It's not easy. It requires effort. It requires practice. Part of the practice is to recognize that there is no, uh, there, there's no judgment here. Judgment is really very, but uh, again, uh, this is when the words get tricky. Discernment, discrimination. Now, discrimination is a bad word in our country right now, but it really just means that we see the difference between one thing and another. It doesn't mean that we say this one is good and this one is bad. It simply means that we see that there is a uniqueness that, that the, in, within the arising, as it reflects into the dualistic world, there is a uniqueness to all of the different aspects and their relationship to each other. And so we try as much as possible to open ourselves and to allow that deep insight, that intuition, to arise, so we, we cultivate that, because that is what is going to help us to navigate all of these difficult waters, all of this, uh, these difficult problems. So again, back to the good girl, bad girl, or why do these bad things happen? According to Tibetan practice, the best way for us to deal with this is to recognize karmic responses are infinite. Once um, a very dear friend of mine asked Sita Rinpoche, what, um, you know, I have this child and this child is just driving me crazy. What did I do? What did I do to deserve this difficult life? And do I need to, you know, I wanna make sure that whatever I did, I don't do it again. I don't make things worse which is a reasonable request, but his answers sort of really knocked us all back on a, he said, trying to understand what you did that caused this circumstance. He said, it's like trying to find one of those sharp things in a pile of grass. So when we realized what he was saying was needle in the haystack. Um, in other words, the influence, what has created this karmic moment is vast, it's vast. When we drop that stone into the water, not only do the ripples go out, but they touch everything in that pond and then they come back again and interfere with each other. And this is the nature of our karmic connections. It's infinite, all of the different uh, influences. And it's not, just us, it's the whole communal activity that is creating this moment that arises for us. So it, the, the point is not, and he went on to elaborate, the point is not to say, this is a good situation, this is a bad situation. The point is to say, where is the wisdom where is the compassion inside this situation? And what can I do skillfully in order to bring this about? This is why it's said, the greatest gift you can give the world is to become enlightened. Because the closer you get to this enlightened state, the more present you are in all the dimensions of consciousness with your wisdom and compassion until that's all there is. There is no longer this sense, the calculator trying to figure out how, how can you get the best for yourself? 
how can you just take care of yourself because you are separate from everything that exists. So in these teachings, we recognize, okay, I have, who knows what my associations were in the past? Who knows what my associations, who knows what I was doing? And, you know, of course, there are different methods that allow us to touch into our previous lives. I've had some very interesting experiences explaining why some of the broader painful strokes of my life were set into motion lifetimes ago by my distorted understanding of reality, my inability to be beneficent on all levels of experience, my willingness to engage in harmful activities to others and self. Okay, so according to these teachings, whatever we've done is not the point in the sense that don't let that identify you. You have the capacity and the opportunity to digest the power of that experience. So one of the first things that you are invited to do is to recognize these things, recognize whatever is arising, whatever you have done, whatever is happening right now. So let's look at this pandemic. This is a good one to use. Okay, so somehow as a collective, all the beings on the planet at this moment have created this distortion, this moment of un unhealthiness. Somehow we all created this. So what is our, what do we do with it? Well, we do whatever our inner guidance tells us to manifest wisdom and compassion in this moment. What is the greatest good for the greatest number? This is not an easy calculation because our sense of personal survival arises in the face of the greater good. And we have to really examine this carefully and never expect that it is a careful examination. It is not a careful examination. It, it requires all kinds of attention, all kinds of discipline, all kinds of taking the situation and analyzing it and taking it apart and figuring out, developing strategy so that as these, this sense of separation arises, you are able to take it apart and to use the energy in that arisal to bring benefit to yourself and to all beings. So I hope that uh, answers that particular question because I thought it, 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 it's really important to understand. So one of the things, one of the first things that we'd be invited to do is what they call practices of purification. This is the sense of letting go of guilt. Guilt, the whole idea of guilt, oh dear, I did these bad things and now bad things are gonna to happen to me. So guilt generates fear. We know that when we cause harm, that somehow the energy in the universe is going to reverberate back to us. And not necessarily in this lifetime. At some point, this energy is going to arise. However, there is a way to modify it because it's not just one trajectory. Again, if you drop a stone into the pond, it may cause a lot of ripples, but you can also engage in various practices in order to ride the waves without any problem. And this is grace, or at least that's what I call it grace, we generate or we create another form of energy to work with this darkness that's coming at us or coming towards us. So we, we do two things. We want to let go of our fixation on I'm a bad girl, and we want to increase our participation in engaging with life, engaging with all of the various beings that arise before us in the most beneficent way possible. We want to inspire them, we want to bless them, we want to feed them, whatever it is, we want to bring benefit. We think about bringing benefit. We feel we're going to let go of whatever mistakes or confusion that we made in the past, we're gonna let it go. 
You're going to feel all the energy that God generated, that this is creating a sense of awakeness so that we engage then in positive methods to, to assist others. And through that process, we become really peaceful, really peaceful. The thing that causes our sense of non-peacefulness is our inner agitation of guilt and fear. So if you want to really become peaceful, examine your life and see how are you causing harm. And if, if you have in the past, and then engage in activities to bring about blessings and beneficence for others. And you will find yourself becoming more and more peaceful and more and more stable. Because the, the root of our agitation has to do with our sense of everything coming at coming at us it's coming at us because we've engaged in some kind of activity that created it so we can transform our situation and transform the conditions in that way okay so now i'm going to uh turn on my gallery view so i can see you all yep and now i'd like to ask what I just communicated, do you have any questions or comments about this communication? If you do, wave your hand. Okay. So you are all comfortable with that little presentation. Okay, Anne Kilby. Okay, Anne, what is your question? Yeah. <clears throat> um, it's not so much a question as an inference. Um, in the purification part, we let go of blaming ourselves. Obviously, we have to give up blaming anybody. And, yeah, and so um, I just wanted to comment on that. I think that's very liberating. Absolutely. Yes, because all of us are caught in this uh, incredible process of experience here on this very challenging planet. All of us are here and we are all trying our best. And if we engage in confusion, we dig a deeper and deeper hole and it's difficult to get out. It's very difficult. Even someone standing there with their hand extended, difficult to take it. And so thank you for reminding us that yes, there's, there's no blame, not for us and not for others. Yeah. Well, thank okay. you. Very good. Okay, anyone else? I saw another hand waving. <laughs> okay, is that Regina? Okay, Regina. Um, there so, go. okay, thank you. So, um, in that practice of letting go of guilt, um, it it seems what came up for me is it seems to involve some sort of forgiveness practices or work with forgiving ourselves and forgiving others. Yeah, that's a very good point. Forgiveness is really important. Forgiveness is, is exactly what I'm talking about, that sense of, okay, this happened. All right, so let's carry on. Be kind, as Plato says. Everybody is fighting a hard war. Be kind. Everyone is fighting within themselves to come to terms with this life that's presented to us. Good point, yes, forgiveness. That is one of the big pieces. To, forgiveness is this idea of, okay, I let go of it. All right, there's, I'm not going to resist because the points of resistance create tension in the body. Tension mm. in the body destroys brain cells. This whole <laughs> book, it goes over and over and over again. What destroys brain cells? Stress. 
stress and tension destroys brain cells. So it's really important for us to not stress about these things. And the easiest way to do that is to forgive. Forgive yourself. Okay, this is, this is a powerful part of the Vajrasattva practice is, okay, I did this. Don't resist it. Don't hide it. Don't pretend it doesn't exist because it's part of the world that we live in. It's part. All of these experiences are part of the world that we live in. But what are we going to do with the world that we live in? How are we going to deal with it? Are we going to become judgmental and resistant? Well, yeah, help yourself. That's the deterioration of the brain cells. So no, let's forgive. Let's keep opening the doors and relax deeper and deeper into our essential nature. And the only way we can do that is if we continually affirm our interconnectivity and wish everybody well. That thought, that wish everyone well, wish ourselves well, if we continually work with that thought alone, the brain cells find new ways to make that happen. And they will reveal through our deep insight and intuition that will reveal itself. So yes, forgiveness, it's that letting go. I forgive you, yes, it's whatever. I forgive myself, let go, open. Thank you. Okay, Good yeah. point. And so I'm gonna bring her to Spotlight. Okay, who's next? Mary Wood, me? Okay. All Hi. right. Good to see you. Um, yeah, I'm so happy I, that you could be with us, Mary. Yeah, so often I'm not able to be with you when you're doing these signs. I'm afraid I'd be in trouble because Prof didn't know I was coming over. Um, my, my question is, that is really hard, I guess my comment question is that it, I think it's extremely difficult to know what does bring benefit to others. So often we wish to bring benefit and sometimes we're trying to be helpful and we end up not being helpful or we fail to do something that could have been helpful because we, we didn't ask the right questions or we didn't know or we weren't observant enough. And I feel like the, sometimes the need to be helpful then becomes kind of pushy, like I need to be helpful. So then it becomes about my, me, what I need and want as opposed to actually what they want. I just find the whole concept of being helpful and I am in the helping professions and I have young grandchildren. And so I'm constantly trying to be helpful but it, it's just such a hard thing. And I feel like the older I get, the more I realize I just need to be more still um, and kind of wait in a sense for things to uh, present to me, but it, I, it's just difficult. But Mary, you see, you answered your own question. What you need to do is get quiet and, and listen more. You know, to, to benefit others doesn't necessarily mean that you solve their problems. In fact, quite the contrary. Solving someone else's problems takes it away sometimes from the, the education that they need to deal with it themselves. So a lot of that whole, you know, uh, what you're talking about isn't fruitful either for you or for them. But if you got quiet, if you got really quiet inside yourself, and that's where you ask the question, what can I do? What can I do to bring benefit? Very often you will hear nothing. There is nothing for you to do. Just send your love and light. A lot of what occurs in this practice, in this work, is the understanding it's not so much the effect you're having on others as the effect your goodwill has on yourself. So, that is very important to maintain a sense of I'm interconnected with all that exists and I want the well being for all. But how to do that? Uh, the Tibetans have a word they call uh, a, a concept of idiot compassion. Uh, this is something that I heard a lot, actually, 
uh, when I was, um, you know, moving around with them, because they said very often people think they're being compassionate and they think they're being helpful, but in fact, they're not taking into account what the other person really needs. So, you know, it's like giving a gift that's useless. You know, you give someone a great big gift and they live in a tiny, tiny house, it's useless. There's nothing that they can do with it. In fact, it's a burden. So givings can be a, a burden it, unless you really, uh, and this, this was a whole lesson that Lama Tenzin gave was on the intelligence of giving, how to give intelligently. And he said, you have to get outside of yourself and think purely of the other being, what is it that they need? And then can you provide that? But it's, he said, it's not an easy thing. This isn't just, a, oh, I'm just gonna go to the store and buy something and that fulfills that. He said, no, everything takes, every gift requires careful attention to what the other person, to what their situation is. So, so you're, you're simply um, coming to terms with that within yourself to recognize that just because someone needs something, you're not necessarily the one to provide that. That's not necessarily really going to help them. So I think your conclusion, just get quiet, get quiet, pray. Pray, ask for guidance. That's that's what I often do is when I'm with someone who presents me with what I think is how I, you know, I ask myself, what can I do here? How can I help this situation? I have to step completely out of it and just pray. You know, please show me. And you know, whether it's the Tara outside of myself or the Tara that I am, that's where I go and ask for some kind of inspiration. And it is pretty amazing how that works. It, it actually is, uh, it's very functional. The more you do it, the more it works, but you really have to let go of any idea of what's good for me. That, has, that definitely doesn't come into the equation. It's not even, you just simply open and say, what can I do? How can I radiate my loving compassion to this person? Yeah. Very powerful. Thank you. That was a good question. Good observation. Yeah. Anybody else? It was, I think I saw Min waving her hand. Amina. Yes. Next, Amina. I will. Oh, Amina. Ah, my Amina. So happy to see you. Hi. So glad to be here. Uh -huh. I, so I, it's kind of a similar situation, but I've really been struggling. And I just thought the other day, oh, I should just call you because sometimes it helps to not just be alone with stuff, um, with a dilemma. And I have a dilemma that there is a man who is homeless that comes to our house. He met my husband at church and he's been coming to our house very regularly to ask for money. Mm -hmm. And I, I've given him some resources in the community. We've given him money. Um, I've set some parameters when the curtain is down, we're not available, you know, we sleep late here and um, but so I, I've prayed and prayed about this and I got one answer well you're going to give him money do it with an open glad heart, you know, be wishing him well, I don't know him very well, you know, we invited him in and talked with him one time a little bit more and um, I learned a little more about him. Uh, it's just like if having discrimination in this. And I've learned, I have a friend who has constant need with chronic health problems. And I've learned how to be with her. And I love her. This person, I don't love. This is not somebody that pulls my heartstrings. But on the other hand, I've prayed, what can I do to help the refugee situation? And one of the answers was, well, one is coming to your door, <laughs> you know. Um, but then like the last couple of times, he's come more frequently asking for more money. Supposedly, he's getting a house. I've tried to call the place supposed to be helping him just to get clarity. You know, is he getting a place to live or whatever? They haven't really responded. And uh gosh, I'm so torn about it. Like 
the first thing I put down when you asked that question earlier with disturbance was email because I had just been doing email. But the second question was, Mark, that's the thing that keeps coming up in my prayers. I put him on prayer lists. I offer prayers for him regularly. I keep asking for guidance. I know that eventually I will get, you know, maybe I, it's not maybe me being uncomfortable is part of the answer with the situation. Uh, I have money, I can give him money, dole it out, $5 here. It used to be, you know, $2 and it was $5. Last time it was $10. Um, and I noticed he had some really good clothes the last time I said, wow, looks like you're getting help with clothes. He said, yes, yeah, they gave me these clothes. He tells me he's taking care of a kitten. Oh, it's so interesting, but I can't ignore it because he comes and knocks on my door like a couple times a week, at least. Who knows? Maybe it'll be four times this next week. So I'm torn between, oh, I should just be giving him or my ex-husband, who was a drug addict, was like, don't give any money to anybody like that because you you're just facilitating you know and i don't i don't i just don't know him so i i don't know what i'm facilitating or not facilitate i haven't got a big no hand which sometimes i do get um so i keep sitting with it and i have to say it's very uncomfortable sitting <laughs> i have to face my own selfishness my own need to have some benefit out of the process, you know. I mean, it's fruitful, that's for sure. And I know I, I, I um, at moments I feel grateful. I, I maybe eventually I'll feel totally grateful. I don't know. <laughs> but I, since we're able to ask questions, this has really been on my mind. Um, right. Well, first of all, you're doing great. You're doing great. This is perfect. It's the perfect situation. It's challenging <laughs> you. It's, it's it's forcing you to examine your motivations. It's making you really get as deep in inside yourself, asking for guidance. All of these things are opportunities. So um, you could also generate gratitude for this opportunity. It's not going to it's not going to be there forever. This is not a forever situation. So all of the thoughts and ideas and feelings and everything that's coming up with this situation is a blessing. It's part of your opportunity to really look at all the different aspects. You see, we can't really see who we are and what's holding us back unless we have a situation that confronts us. We simply can't see it. And we're certainly not going to seek out these situations because they're uncomfortable. But in the middle of the uncomfortableness is the stimulus to get us to go deeper, to look deeper, to discover more. So there's no, again, I mean, this goes back to Mary's observation is, you know, what do I do that's really helpful? Is, is what I'm doing helpful? Is my taking this on, how much of it do I take on and how much of it is helpful? Or like your ex-husband says, are you just giving him more money so that he can maintain some kind of unhealthy uh, activity? You don't know that. You can only go on your intuition unless you really want to follow the guy around for a while and find out what's going on. Obviously, you do to a certain extent want to find out what's going on since you called the house to see if he actually was going to be there. You know, that's valid. Yeah, it was, that, it's, a, yeah. it's a charitable organization that is helping him. And I just called them to, yeah, to try to connect with them about it and hope that he is really getting a place to live and stuff. But what I notice as you're talking to me is I notice I start to breathe more. And it really goes back to what you were just talking about, about that tension and how damaging that tension is to us. And, you know, seems so simple, but one thing is it, I, like I've, I've had this dilemma with my husband, I felt very critical about his food choices and saying that, and I know it's not healthy. And finally, after a lot of prayer, it came to me, when that comes up for me, tell him I love him. 
And I'm thinking, you know, when this tension about Mark comes up, it's a really good reminder for me to breathe. Because I notice as you're talking to me how I, I, I start to breathe deeper instead of getting all right. tense around the whole thing. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Because you thing, can do such this. a simple thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, the, yeah. the breathing is, is the easy part. The remembering to breathe is the hard part. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, Min? Hi, Prima. Did you? Hi. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the forgiveness and not blame to anybody. It's, it's, it's a different level. And I do. I can help myself to blame others and not forgive others at the moment. Like, not for long, but like, very temporary. I do, and I forget about it. Uh, my question is lesson. Something that I can learn from you, and I want to practice. The lesson you mentioned that there are painful situations, but they will all um, we we will grow our inner. They will help our inner growth, and. There is a very um, Korean traditional um, stories that all Korean kids grow with that stories. Uh, two brothers, the one Hungu is very poor, has lots of kids. And then elder brother, Norbu, he's very rich, like uh, really like very rich billionaire. So one day, Hungu, has so many kids and wife and no food, a few days, starving. He came to our uh, elder brother, asked for food. And then the brother said, okay, I have some gift for you. And he took the wooden rice, steam rice uh, uh, scoop and slapping Hungu's face. It was, and then, the Hung, what Hungu said was he saw a little bit of steam rice in his uh, chin and he tasted it. He said, Thank you very much. Can you slap in my left chin? <laughs> and, and I just like, and then they saying that, oh, Hungu is so nice. I feel like, first of all, and then this is violent. You, you can let even brothers slap in your face with even just a little bit of steam rice, the rice is here. You don't appreciate it. You walk away from him, you know? And I didn't understand. And the story is that oh, how nice younger brother, even the elder brother slapping his face, say, thank you. I feel gratitude, please slapping my face the other side, so I can put in a bit of steam rice to my family. And then, because he's so nice, in the end, he got a fortune from God. And I didn't understand that lesson. I, I, I never liked that lesson, but hopefully <laughs> I know that lesson. And like, when somebody <laughs> doing this a painful lesson or gift to, you don't show the other side of chin, you know? And, and for me, when you talk about um, painful situation or pain and suffering and challenge, you breathe in, open your heart and you learn, you examine your experience and you learn from it and, and, and take that as your lesson. But Prema, I want to ask you, and I want to ask Tara too, why do we need this painful, challenging, uh, suffering lesson? Can we have not? Uh, can, we have a, can, we have a, can we not have a painful lesson in our journey and we can still learn from it? Well, uh, if you have, good luck, but that doesn't, <laughs> 
my observation of the world is it doesn't work that way. You know, the rose has the thorns. Are we going to complain about the fact that the rose has thorns? Or are we going to accept the fact that the rose has thorns? Because complaining doesn't do any good. Complaining actually deteriorates the, uh, the brain cells. So we don't want to do that. We don't want deterioration of the brain cells. We want to increase the brain cells and make them functional. And the way we do that is by being creative. So we take these different painful circumstances. They're endemic. They're natural to our world. They're natural to our world. The baby, when it gets teeth, it hurts. The teeth cutting through the gums, it hurts. So, but once the baby continues, then they have teeth. The baby learning to walk, how many times does the baby fall down? Many times, but in order for the muscles to get strong and coordinated, the baby needs to fall down a few times to figure out where the muscles are. And so this is what is endemic in our world. It's natural, it's a natural part of our world. So what are we going to do about that? Well, first of all, complaining about it doesn't do us any good. We can, yeah, we can whine and complain as much as we want, but that doesn't help. What helps? That's for me, what the question is. What, okay, whether we have these conditions or not, we have these conditions. There it is. The pandemic is a condition. We have this condition. Now, what are we going to do about it? That's our choice. That's where we can look at it. Rather than complaining about it, we need to look at it and see, okay, what do, what do I have in my uh, arsenal, in my, uh, in my uh, cupboard that can deal with this in my emotional understanding? What do I have? And then go from there go from there. And this is where a lot of times thinking about something doesn't solve the issue because the, the, the solution is not in the thinking box. The solution is outside the box. So this is why what we're encouraged to do is to develop different aspects to develop different ways of dealing with these challenging situations that will empower us. If we go to the sense, if we go to the place of whining and complaining, that disempowers us, that takes our power away. So if we take the situation and instead we try to figure out, okay, how can I use this situation to get strong inside myself, to serve the people around me, to help the people around me? How can I use this situation? And we call upon our creative mind and our intuitive mind. And in order to get at that, we need to be able to relax deeply. We need to be able to let go. We have to stop because resistance is stressful and stress brings everything down. So you want to avoid that as much as possible. So we, that's why we do certain kinds of meditative practices. This is where the different practices that we do together, the practice of, um, of motivation, very important because it keeps reminding us, okay, I'm here in this world, not to uh, change everything, but I'm here to live a life of wisdom and compassion. That's what I'm here to do. And I'm here to be able to bring this to the people around me. I'm here to figure out how can I help others skillfully, not just you know throw things at them because I think it's going to be good for them, but to really think deeply, how can I help? So, and it, these different practices cultivate our capacity to do that. The invocation of sources of refuge. So yes, talk to Tara, absolutely. Because Tara doesn't solve your problems. Tara helps you to get deeper into your own intuitive mind base. And there the answer sits. It's not her where the answer sits. The answer sits in your own question. Thank you. I, uh, yeah. I think it's really important to remember that Tara doesn't have 
our personal issues. Thank you. And right. thank you for now I'm learning that um, stop whining and complaining from the nature <laughs> of life lessons. Uh, I don't need to say thank you for all this suffering, but at least I have to start whining and complaining from this nature of life lessons and um, not asking Tara to help with these issues. I'm the one had to examine and learn from it and get through it. Yes, and eventually, according to the mind training practices, you actually learn to say thank you. You actually learn to say, aha, okay, look, look, what, look at this incredible challenging opportunity, like Amina's situation. Wow, this is a really challenging opportunity, but it's an opportunity and I'm grateful for whatever life presents me because I know that as I continually open to it, I'm going to go deeper into an understanding of who I truly am and what my resources are. And it's far vaster than we even imagine, than we even imagine. <clears throat> so the more we whine and complain, the more we can't see our inner, our inner uh, capacity. But the more we accept and we open and we look and we think, what, what can I do here that brings the greatest benefit? What can I do here? And just listen without getting too involved in the mind going, we find a lot of inspiration then. Yeah. Thank you. For so thank you for your question, Ben. That's very, very good, very helpful. Okay, anyone else? Any other hands waving? Anyone else have something they want to share? Okay, perfect. Let's see, how are we doing? Oh my goodness, the time just flies, doesn't it? So we need to take a break. And uh, I'm going to give you five minutes to just stand up and move around and get something to drink and take care of yourself. I will be back in five. Bye for now. Okay. So here we are. Can't believe that <laughs> I talked so much, but anyway, that's okay. That's what we're here for. So I wanted to mention now, in working with this material about these observations of brain research, there were several points that were very important to our practice. Now, the first one, of course, is this understanding of relaxation. And <clears throat> again and again, it has been proven. I mean, he showed so many different forms of research about the whole idea of relaxation, remaining alert and yet relaxing in the body. So there are several very simple exercises that you can do in a very short time. Now, one of the uh, quotes that I keep bumping up against in this material is that even a few moments of this kind of practice every single day will completely alter the neurotransmitters in the brain because they're very adaptable, but they require consistent approach. So it's very important for us to ferret out what are the negative um, stories that we tell ourselves, the judgmental stories, the stories like um, Min was saying, the, wane, the whining and complaining stories, you know, wherever they are, we want to root them out because they bring us down, they inhibit us. And it's actually quite, we're quite capable of changing that channel just by looking at it and by understanding it and developing strategies to change it. So even small amounts of this practice. Now, 
uh, you have heard me talk about the nine healing breaths now for years, right? This is perfect because it doesn't take more than two minutes to do the nine healing breaths. You can do it at any time. You could do it anywhere and under any circumstances because nobody knows what you're doing. You don't have to do any chanting or any, any uh, other exotic activity in order to bring the mind to a state of comfort, to, to relax, to let go, let go of your tension. Tension occurs in the body in the emotions and in the mind, and you can command it to let go. And, you know, just really persist, do small amounts, do small amounts, but do it often. Make and break your work up. Don't, you know, try to drive through, drive through, because you don't want to increase any amount of tension or stress in the body mind. So that's number one. Is, is that aspect. But then as I continued to look at this study, I kept thinking about one of the things that they that is emphasized is when you think about something that you're moving towards, that that, is, that provides as much energy as the actual accomplishment itself. And so when we're engaged in Tara practice, we are constantly thinking about you know, the qualities of the 21 Taras. One of the uh, requests that I had was would I speak about how do the 21 qualities work? How does it work? Well, the, the way that it works is that we're telling ourselves, I have this fabulous relationship with the Tara in front of me. I myself, whatever she has, I have within myself. And if I engage in this way, I can inspire the people around me just as Tara inspires me. So the goal of the practice is to reveal within your own body mind all of the qualities of Tara. They are latent within you or as you activate them, they're not latent, they're actually engagements. This is the way you engage with the world. You engage with the world as a being of courage. You are willing to see what your negativities are and to, to break them apart and to engage, to see how you can use this negative experience as a positive empowerment. How can you do that? It's be creative about your life. Really see the situations. When I asked you to write down, what are, the, what is, what are your difficulties? What has been, what preoccupies you? So as we talk about these various strategies, which ones can you use in order to see this preoccupation as a blessing in your life? So as we engage, now we also need to recognize there are obstacles, definitely. That's, this planet is made of obstacles. It's fantastic. All the opportunities we have for overcoming obstacles will, in, will strengthen us. A very dear friend of mine, her 18-year-old her son had just graduated from high school with honors and he'd gotten a full, full scholarship to college. And uh, he was on the beach celebrating with his friends and he did some kind of backflip and broke his neck and ended up a quadriplegic. Now, this is a young man who was in the prime of his life, you know, with, with everything arrayed before him, all the possibilities. And of course, when we, you know, it was a big shock to us all. But over the course of a few months, his mother was closely in touch with me. And she said to me, you know what he said? He said, you know, mother, I never realized how unbelievably selfish I was and how limited my world was. He said, I know it's a horrible thing that has happened to me, but it's also a blessing what's happened to me because it has completely changed my mind and my understanding of what life is about. Now, that was a very, uh, you might say, um, an amazing young man that was quite advanced for, but the, uh, the understanding, we can all do this. 
whatever is coming at us, whatever difficulty is coming at us, whatever conditions are coming at us. And when we find ourselves preoccupied with them so that they continually arise in the mind and distract us and try to pull us down, then we need to develop strategy. So I wanted to, this uh, gentleman, the, this book, they developed a series of strategies. So I want you to consider as we, now remember you have written down on your paper, your challenge, right? Whatever it is that's really challenging you right now. So <clears throat> here's the first strategy, okay? Now, I'm going to try to just to explain <laughs> the, the, the languaging here. <clears throat> You're going to write down, if, if I start to engage in an unproductive behavior, then I will. So what is your strategy? What are you going to do? So in other words, let's say, um, let's take Amina's thought. If I begin to be worried about my relationship with this man, Okay, what am I going to do? So now, are you going to, in her case, she actually told us what she's going to do. She's going to breathe. She's going to get in touch with her breath because that's what she realized wasn't working. That's what she realized she was inhibited by. <clears throat> now, you can come up with as many strategies as you want, but it's good to really have something so that as the emotion arises and you feel yourself possessed by the uh, desire or the impulse to judge yourself or others harshly, to move away from the sense of interconnectivity and compassion, then you're going to put this strategy in place that brings you back to the sense of interconnectivity, wisdom and compassion. So that's the first strategy, rejoicing. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a moment to write something down. What is your, what, what are you going to tell yourself when this, what is the unproductive behavior? So you decide what that is. Are you worrying? Are you stressing out? What, what, are, what is going on that is non-functional for you? And then, what are you going to do to change that? Okay, so the next strategy, the strategy of ignoring. So now let's say if I feel the urge to judge myself harshly for some reason, if I feel the urge to feel guilty, if I feel the urge to feel incompetent, if I feel the urge to run away, so this is called the strategy of ignoring, then I'm just going to ignore it. I'm just gonna look at it and say, you're useless. You're not helping me at all. I know you're there, but I'm going to ignore it. So these are different try them out strategies. They're try them out. What they found through their research, and this was extensive research, that all of these were effective for some people, some of the time. So I'm only telling you what they found to be effective. Okay, then the strategy of negating. If I slip into a bad habit, overworking, overeating, something that really is causing personal self-harm, then I choose to interrupt it. So this is when you notice yourself going into a bad habit, I'm interrupting it. Of course, that sounds to me to be similar to the strategy of ignoring. But most important, what they felt was the most helpful thing to do was to keep a gratitude list. So now I'm gonna give you a few moments for this. So I want you to write down on your paper, the people you are grateful for to have in your life. 
the things you are grateful for. The experiences you are grateful for. The values that you possess. Your personal accomplishments. Now what is recommended is that you continue to add to this list. And when you are feeling <clears throat> overwhelmed, depressed, or in any kind of difficulty, read your gratitude list. Make it a habit to add to your gratitude list. And this could be a good cup of coffee, uh, a, a, a some kind of food that you enjoy, a, a beautiful sunset, a walk along the beach. It, there's no, it doesn't really matter. Just have what, how, what are you grateful for having in your life? This is very, very helpful and important. So now one of the, uh, this this one really tickled me, actually, if I can find it. Okay, so now another invitation is When you determine what is your personal challenge, think about a positive quality. So for instance, when I'm feeling angry, I breathe in love and I breathe out compassion. When I'm feeling sad, I breathe in happiness, I breathe out joy. So now put this in your own words. What is, it, what is the feeling tone that dis, disorients you or disturbs you? When I'm feeling judgmental, I, I breathe in love, I breathe out forgiveness, something like that. See, write, write these in your own words. I'm gonna give you a moment to do that. Okay, so now this particular practice really tickled me because of course, having so much experience with this particular one through my association in Hinduism and Buddhism, there is a sound meditation that not only interrupts inner speech, but also lowers neural activity throughout the brain. We're going to repeat this word, drawing it out as long as we comfortably can. Breathe deeply, pay close attention to every nuance of the experience, okay? So since I can't hear you, this is good. You can get started while I'm reading and telling you how to work with this. So the word that they recommend is OM, okay? so. What you are recommended to do, I want you to close your eyes and breathe deeply and then breathe out the syllable. Oh. 
I'll continue that as I read. Pay close attention to the nuances of this experience, the way the sound resonates in your body, the sensations of chest, the sensations of your throat, the sensations of your face. As you continue to chant, feel the different tonal qualities and let these sensations take you into a deep trance-like state. As you continue to chant, this rapidly changes the neural activity of the brain. It opens the brain to having more insight and intuition. Oh. Okay, open your eyes, stretch, uh, stretch, stretch. Yep, 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 stretch. Uh, excellent, okay, very good. Now, how did that feel? How did that feel, that practice? Okay, I'm going to just, See who hasn't spoken. Carrie, how did that feel? That was, um, I feel very, re that was relaxing. And also it brought me in touch with what was going in with, on with my body. And so that was helpful to kind of go to different spots and see how it affected that. Yeah, I've got my, definitely got my mind off whatever was going else going on with it. Good point. Yes. It's so simple. It's so simple. I, it just delighted me when I read this. I thought, and this guy is talking to all of these corporate hoo-ha people, you know, this is, that's what he, <laughs> this is about, you know, and of course, and we've been doing this for who knows how long, but without that attention, without that awareness, without that moving through the body made all the difference. Thank you for your sharing, Carrie. Yeah. Yeah, Xenia, how was it for you? Hi, Prema. Yeah, it was very, very good, relaxing, because um, I was very focused in the first section um, on the translation, and then uh, for this second session, I could really breathe uh, in this exercise, so it was more, more connecting body, my body, because I was more in a speech mind <laughs> before. Excellent. And now I, I was uh, researching, really scanning my, my body, feeling it. It was good. Wonderful. So everyone else, just to let you know, Xenia and Maya have been doing a simultaneous translation into Portuguese for our wonderful Portuguese uh, friends. So thank you, Xenia and Maya for your service. I'm sure they appreciate. Linda Lakshmi, how did how was it for you? Now, this is nothing new, yeah? Yes, thank you. Um, it's nothing new, but you know, we need to be reminded. I need to be reminded so many times. I can't believe the minute you said that, all of a sudden it just, pulled me into a meditative state. I mean, because that's one of the mantras I would have used for many, many years. And all of a sudden it was just transformative. It just calmed me just, but I hadn't, like you said, I hadn't done it um, 
I mean, I'd done it to go into meditation and everything, but I hadn't thought of it to shift the negative thoughts. So this is very helpful. This is, I think, something easy that I can do if I can remind myself, you know, just. Yes. Yes, I think that's what I enjoyed about all these different exercises the most is that they're easy. This is really easy stuff. It's not, uh, and to know that they took these very simple exercises and hooked people up to their machines and showed the effectiveness. I mean, of course, I've been going to all of these teachings with all of these great teachers and I've done all this practice, et cetera, et cetera. But I love this. Somehow there's something about it that brings, it's more impactful for me. Gwendolyn, how was it for you? You have to unmute yourself, darling. Oops, where did you go? There you are, okay. Uh, the first word that came to me when you posed the question was deep. It took me to a very deep, quiet place. And I was observing the different vibrations, the different times I was doing it. And it was a very calm kind of, I'd say letting go, but there wasn't a sense of something I let go of. And um, I did start thinking about something. And I think it was related to what you were talking about um, in the teaching, but without any effort, I just immediately shifted back into observing um, the sensation. So that, I appreciated that. So it's very powerful, yeah. Yes, it's very powerful. I'm so happy that we can use this beautiful, beautiful practice. Karen Mehta, I'm so happy to see you could join us. How was it for you? Uh, I was like trying to write down stuff and do it. And um, I, I just, I had this realization that, um, uh, you know, like as we're going through whatever we're going through stuff, all of us are, and, um, and, and it's, there's always this tendency, or at least I can speak for myself to reach like, what can I do? And then it's, it's just so like, like we do know these things. We do know about mantras and, and Om and, and it's so simple. And, um, but there's this tendency of the mind to reach outside and, you know, like I need some magic bullet and, and it's right here, it's right here. And so when I was doing it, I, I felt, um, I felt, the vibration throughout my body and I'm having this work done on my teeth my jaws and and it was vibrating in my teeth and it was just like uh, it was just it was incredible mm -hmm. so um yes and I I tuned in late but I want to know this book too that you're referring to oh yes okay let me see if I can quickly find I, did you receive the notes from last the last Zoom? Because it was there on the notes. I may have. I don't know. But um, OK. Uh, here it is. OK. Neuro wisdom. OK. Neuro wisdom. The new brain science of money, happiness, and success. Now, all of his all of his uh, activities were oriented towards how to be successful. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, you know, in teaching these CEOs and so forth, I'm sure that that's what they all want is, you know, how to make more money, how to be more successful. But I took everything and translated it as, okay, what is it that we really want? Well, we want awakened mind. We want to become enlightened. So that was the goal that I used in all of these different exercises that he encouraged. I've only taken a few of them. Now, one of the other things that, see, according to um, the research, the most powerful thing that we can do is, and of course we know this, 
the most powerful thing we can do is touch base with, now he calls it intuition, right? Why well, call it insight? But it's wisdom mind. That's what we wanted. That's what we always want to go there with everything. Because from that place, then the result of our activity is compassion, automatic. Now, remember, these are just words. Compassion and wisdom don't really, they're not the thing itself. This is what's tricky about these kinds of teachings. You know, they, we tend to almost solidify around them when actually they are the most vibrant activity available. The, the wisdom is this sense, this understanding, this experience of awakeness, of knowingness, of the, the entire arising is all one unified field. And that's an experience, a deep from the bones experience. And when we experience that, there is a radiance to that experience. It's like looking at the sun. The radiance is compassion. But, you know, compassion has that little edge, you know, of, of uh, oh, poor person. It's, it's really not that. It's an embrace. It's with, you know, the word compassion means with passion. It means that the connectivity is passionate. It's not sterile. It's passionate. And because of that, if someone is confused or suffering, it naturally is going to go there. How do we deal with it? The insight, if that, if we, if we're not trying to have some personal agenda of either um, uh, gathering, you know, uh, attachment or aversion or rejecting, if we don't have personal personal agenda, then insight will automatically arise. This is where, as we engage in these practices, it becomes more and more common until the mind really stops, you really see whatever thoughts are coming. Now, this is the, 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 what I wanna end on because he repeatedly points out, mindfulness is the tool, the main tool for us to disarm our obsessive mind. Now, what is mindfulness? Again, here's another word for us. But basically, it means being able to look at the content of mind, to look at it without judgment, and to know that it is simply content, that it is not the mind itself. So it's not, as we started this talk two hours ago, it's not that innate purity, which uh, Pema Chodron calls our human goodness that comes from Trungpa, our human goodness. That's our innate mind, right? It's not, it's the clouds that arise within it and recognizing that they are just clouds, that they do not taint the mind. And so mindfulness is constantly being, having the capacity to be aware of the mind's activity and whether it is moving in a, in the in the direction of interconnectivity or whether it's moving in the direction of isolation isolation is dangerous and destructive interconnectivity is positive blessing fulfillment so that's the and practicing that you don't have to sit on a cushion to practice that you can find yourself you know you're in the grocery line okay I don't know about the Brasileiros, but I know for us, we've got long grocery lines, right? We're sitting there with the basket <clears throat> and we're waiting. Excellent opportunity to practice mindfulness. See, where is my mind? What is my mind doing? What is it thinking? Am I breathing? Am I resonating inside my being? Am I radiating light and love? Or am I completely locked down, focused on what makes me miserable. Because in fact, the brain has more tendency to go to the negative than it does to the positive. It takes effort and energy to redirect the power of the mind to the positive. 
but that's that that's what we need to do none of this that i'm communicating you should not imagine that any of it is snap your fingers and it's over but all of these ways of engagement will transform your personal experience it just it takes even in this um, uh, in these notes i noticed once again i've underlined do it every day for several months before you see the change but you will because it actually changes the neurotransmitters of the brain but it it's consistent you have to do it and you know discipline good luck good luck but do it it's okay and 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 don't <clears throat> beat yourself up if you don't do it that's the other thing is yeah it takes a while before we can institute a positive habit it's not always you know easy to remember to do that oh my god i can't believe it it's one o'clock over here already so i hope that this has been an enriching time for you before i say a dedication prayer is there anything else any other question or anything anyone wants to share before i sign out it's so exciting to see yes um okay Karen. I run across this thing about um in in some esoteric systems that um that an equal and opposite reaction happens to every action that we do. And I, I don't really believe that. What do you think about that? Well, okay, going back to what Sita Rinpoche says, I believe it's true, but the action is so complex. Oh, it's yeah. not like one little thing, you know? Um, it, it never is one little thing. There's, we're, everything is interacting at the same moment and so equal i mean that's like saying that we live in a black and white universe we don't live in a black and white universe so you know all of those gray and all the colors and everything else yes and they all reflect that good luck trying to sort out you know a single impulse in there it's too complicated but yes the you know uh it 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 is logical okay the the size of the rock is going to make a certain kind of effect but then it goes way beyond that so it's never just one thing but do you think it like creates an opposite effect like if um if i'm positive then a negative reaction is going to happen in equal proportion oh no i don't agree with that at all yeah Okay. No, no. And I, I, I that doesn't make any sense. So no, I'd like to say something <laughs> about that if I could. This is Amina. My yeah. I have a friend and I used to be well, part of my coming out of like about codependency stuff was to look for reciprocal relationships, you know, and because I learned there are some people you just give to that just say thank you and they'll just take, take, take and not necessarily give back. But then I met a new friend and she taught me what she called the hammock theory, which is to never worry about what I'm getting back and only give what I want to give when I'm wanting to give it and not worry about it and know that the universe will bring back to me what I need when I need it, wherever I need it. And that has been really a blessing to live like that. <laughs> well done. Well done. Okay, fantastic. So now uh, please close your eyes for a moment and just imagine the wonderful blessing, the vitality of sharing with an open heart these inspired words, this wonderful lineage of practice that we've received. So with hearts just brimming with gratitude, we send our light and love out into the world. And we pray that whatever interactions that we may have with other beings, that it, we may all be surrounded with love and light and that our world will do its best to come to a state of peace and well-being for all. Om Oh,
Oh.